Isis, really. One as a close personal friend of mine, and secondly as a very distinguished scholar on politics and political thinking. And thirdly, and most importantly, really, as a thoroughly convinced and decent egalitarian and democrat and um, expert on human rights. And it's in the last category that he's going to speak to us. David and I worked together on a thing called Democratic Audit, which miraculously still exists. And it's on the web. <coughs> and if you want to know about democracy in the United Kingdom, you'll find virtually everything you need to know there. So that's lots of very good comparative information. And David wrote this paper called Unelected Oligarchy, Corporate and Financial Dominance in, British Demo in Britain's Democracy. And that's the theme on which he's going to talk to us tonight. David, thank you. Thanks very much. Well, I'm sorry my connection with the Labour Party um, was severed a long, long time ago. <laughs> But I should say, I, I was, as Stuart was, I was an elected city councillor, well, for, in, for Manchester in my case, and a parliamentary candidate, and, but decided not to pursue a political career. I, I think I came to the conclusion I wasn't hard-skinned enough to, <laughs> to continue, so I, I went the softer route to uh, academia. Um, well, this is uh, welcome to May Day. I'm afraid this is not a very uplifting <laughs> talk for May Day because it's uh, what's wrong and rotten with Britain's democracy and I suppose perhaps at the end I'll say something about what we might do about it but um, that's not in this paper anyway I'm going to just briefly summarize this paper which I have copies of but I won't circulate them now because then you'll everyone I haven't enough for everybody anyway and um, you'll just get buried in the in the copy uh, I'm going to just uh, briefly well I'm going to summarize the theme of it and um, then at, at the end, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to start with a, with a quote, a quote from it, because where I start, I think will um, will register with you, because what a, how I start this paper, which is about the different ways in which the corporate and financial sector come to take over Britain's democracy, the policy making, and the state, basically. And that's an old Marxist thing, and we used to study. I followed Ralph Miliband as the professor of politics at Leeds University. We used to study Ralph Miliband and state and capitalist democracy and so on, which was all about how capitalist democracy has run, cap capitalism runs the state. But um, I don't think he would have dreamt of the extent <laughs> to which it is now infiltrated into the public life. Anyway, so I start started this paper. Well, that's what the paper's about, what my talk is going to be about. And I'll, uh, Stuart said half an hour. Does that seem appropriate? Or is that too long? We don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, you won't see. You can tell me. You can tell me whether it's too long. I'm going to read. You can start putting your hands. This is this is this is the only bit. I'm, this is the only bit I'm going to read actually, because it does. Uh, it starts. Uh, it will be worth beginning by posing a simple question or question series. How have we arrived at a situation where the government has been unable to prevent a near terminal crisis of the banking system from taking place with a subsequent rec recession affecting all sectors of the economy including the public finances? Secondly, has only been able to prevent a total collapse of financial markets by using enormous sums of taxpayers' money to bail out the banking sector? Three, expects the burden of resolving the crisis to be borne by ordinary taxpayers, service users, welfare dependents and other vulnerable groups rather than the banks which were mainly responsible for the crisis. For we seemingly are unable to control the bonus culture in the financial sector or to get credit flowing to the businesses on which economic revival depends. And five, is so pusillanimous, sorry, that's a word that uh, perhaps I shouldn't have used, pusillanimous, in very carefully chosen, in reforming the way the banking system is organised, which Sir Mervyn King has described as the worst it is possible to have. And I have two nice quotes from Mervyn King to back up, so this is not just a lefty diatribe I'm engaged in. The price of this financial crisis, he, he, sp he said, is being borne by people who absolutely did not cause it. Um, and then with a Churchillian flourish, never in the field of financial endeavour has so much been owed to so many by so few. 
um, which is a nice turn round of the Churchillian uh, phrase. Well, um, so why is the government so impotent or unable to do anything about any of these things? Or we could add, since 2011, why has it proved so unable or unwilling to close, close the loopholes which allow corporations uh, to avoid corporation tax and wealthy individuals to avoid income and capital gains tax and so on? Why is it proved unable or unwilling to close down the many tax havens? The British Virgin Islands have figured recently, but um, they, they are responsible for, um, for a, a good, goodly proportion of um, tax evasion and avoidance. Treasure, treasure Islands, Saxton calls it. Did I call him right? Why is it unable to get growth going in the economy or uh, rebalance the economy? Um, and so on. It's not surprising that on the latest surveys, high percentage of the electorate have lost faith in government's capacity to do anything with the economy which would improve their living standards. Well, this paper is an attempt to, uh, to explain why um, governments have now are, are un unable to act in what seems to be the public interest um, in, uh, in dealing with so many of the issues which concern us. So one part of the explanation, and I go back to my um, Ralph Miliband's Marxist um, structure and agency. One part of the explanation is structural and <coughs> I'm just going to take out three different structural elements which actually act as a, uh, as it were, debilitating, um, disempowering element in, in government. Um, the first, and these will be all familiar to you, so I don't need to spend very long on them. First is is the is ideological, the the dominance of um, the triumph of neoliberalism from the 80s onwards, or what Stiglitz calls market fundamentalism, or more recently, since her death, we've come to call Thatcherism, or has been revived the term Thatcherism, whatever term we like to use, which has two related sets of ideas. One is that unfettered markets constitute a self-regulating uh, and self-correcting device to maximise efficiency and economic growth, which will trickle down uh, to the lower orders, and by contrast, the state is wasteful, incompetent, and bureaucratically restrictive on business enterprise. That's one part of the, uh, of the, of the ideology. The other is that market models of competition and consumer choice provide the only way to improve service delivery in the public sector and that citizens should be reconfigured primarily as consumers. These, I'm sure, are very familiar um, ideas to you and I don't need to elaborate them. There was one, uh, and these did not emerge out of thin air, and Stiglitz, I think, when he's uh, discussing these, this makes perfectly clear that uh, the, 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 uh, the, 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 those who would benefit from the, these ideas were, lar were largely responsible through think tanks, through, um, through their own uh, pressure, through university economics departments. Uh, so forgive me if there are any economists from the university here. Stiglitz, in his, one of his recent books, said uh, the economics profession has ceased to be a science and has come to be a cheerleader for um, market capitalism. Um, but that was one of his more perhaps extreme formulations, but he's a, he a Nobel Prize winner in economics, so perhaps we should li listen to what he says. Um, I mean, there is an intriguing question here, intriguing question, um, which I've never, not yet, heard a completely satisfactory answer to, and perhaps we can try it around this table. Why, when these ideas uh, of neoliberalism have so manifestly failed and proved erroneous and mistaken in the banking collapse, in the chronic recession, in the oligopolies, in the gas and electricity industries, in the privatisation of the railways, in the marketisation of the health service and so on, why do they still hold sway? Private good, public bad, four legs good, two legs, two legs bad, to quote Orwell, seems to be the mantra which is still going on even when the... Uh, uh, the, the humans have been brought back into the fold of the animal farm. 
so the second um, of these structural elements is, econ is economic um, the globalization and financialization of economic activity which makes transnational corporations the dominant force in economic life able to shift their activities and tax liabilities between countries and so exert enormous pressure on the conditions of employment, regulatory regimes, tax levels and so on um, in individual countries to secure conditions most favourable to themselves. And the contrast between the international level at which businesses operate and the national level of governments has put governments at a severe disadvantage and diminished their capacity to uh, frame economic policy, let alone get the taxes. And of course it's the taxation element of this which has become so prominent with UK uncut and, uh, and, and the, uh, uh, the Occupy movement <coughs> and, and the scandals really of these large businesses which don't pay <coughs> any corporation tax and have not for years. And um, it's very clear the different mechanisms which are at work and are open to them to transfer pricing um, to, to, get, uh, to, to sh shift their profits where, um, where, where the, the, they can get uh, least, uh, where they are least taxed and it, I mean increasingly m most of British industry is now taken over <coughs> by the top, in the, of the top um, uh, 100 companies I think 90 something are actually owned by multinationals and will not pay um, you know, will not pay any corporation tax because it's transferred overseas to other jurisdictions uh, of which the Virgin Islands is, uh, is, is a notable one. So that's the second sort of structural element that, uh, that, that incapacitates governments and, and the third is operational I, I would call it. That's the decline and this is one that's not so often as it were brought together in this same package it, which is the decline of government expertise and organisational capacity which follows from the other two, follows from privatisation, follows from the rubbishing of the state as, as bureaucratic and so on, follows from the elevation of the private sector as the only way of doing things. It, it means that there's a, a, a great under capacity of skills of, 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 at all, in, in all ways in, in across the, the, the public sector. And the evidence of this, um, which I document in the paper, is the growth of consultancies and the spending of government uh, con, con, uh, not funny, money on consultancies, which reached a height under Blair, actually, um, which uh, was was I think it quadrupled under the, the spending of government money on, on uh, consultancies quadrupled under Blair and what tends to happen then is not just that the consultants then themselves brought in will advise and recommend private sector solutions to any problem that the government has but they have <coughs> there is clearly a, a, um, a massive conflict of interest so, for example, the spin watch, which is an uh, activity that looks at, um, you know, uh, is, is part of the, uh, looks at lobbying in particular, but, but uh, cons stretched consultancy. They did this study of McKinsey's, um, the, the, the company which was brought in to advise the government on the reforms of the National Health Service and actually wrote some of the legislation. Uh, of the NHS, of, of, of the reforms of the health service at the same time as they were advising clients which the private health providers on how they would benefit from or take advantage of the opportunities that their writing of the legislation would afford to them. So the enormous conflicts of interest and you probably find that this, I mean we know this uh, now most recently in the tax area where the, the, um, the accountants firms advise the, the tax <coughs> authorities on new tax legislation at the same time as they're advising their clients on how to get round them. It's not clear whether they actually build the loopholes into the legislation <laughs> but <coughs> you know that is the, uh, I mean these are two um, examples which have clearly hit the public 
um, arena but, but this must be going on across government that, the re, that once you bring in consultants who have clients who work for them they have a, 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 a conflict of interest which um, clearly is, uh, is, is, is not ad advantageous to the public um, to the public interest and it's about all this is about private interests capturing the state in one way or another <coughs> so you have this combination of loss of capacity um, that, that, um, and, and dependency of government on the private sector um, as a result of these structural what we might call structural factors but we shouldn't ignore the fact that behind structures are agents who are actually promoting these particular structural changes <coughs> so that's the first part of the paper and the second part of the paper is more about agency <coughs> and that's about the modes of active influence um, which are available and the paper documents in quite uh, elaborate detail um, of uh, the different ways, the different modes of influence and power which the corporate sector and the financial sector in particular is able to wield directly over government policy. I did, um, after I wrote this paper, which was two years ago, it's still very current in terms of the themes, very, in fact more so now than when it was uh, written, um, but I did try and uh, set myself what turned out to be a labour of Sisyphus to actually keep it up to date. And every week you will find a new story um, which actually illustrates. Uh, and so I tried to, to do, I, I, I got two up, as far as two updates, and then it got out of. But I have a pile of press cuttings. I know that's very old fashioned, but uh, Stuart and I were brought up on press cuttings. And from there you can go to the. Um, internet and look uh, look up and check the check whether the stories are accurate or I not. I might <coughs> add here that um, Open Democracy <coughs> published the update. So people would like to check check it out. It's on the Our Kingdom site on Open Democracy. <coughs> well, there's there's the, the powers are those of money and um, and and personal uh, connections, personal contacts, and of course one the, 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 and both together. Um, so the money comes through the wealthy individuals, corporations come through we're, we should be now familiar with financing, financing of political parties the Tory party election campaign of 2010 50% of that was financed by, um, by financial companies um, so it's not surprising that they're not exactly that Osborne is not exactly keen is brought dragging in fact to the issue of banking reform and, um, and so on um, the financing think tanks um, some companies don't like being seen too, too political so they finance think tanks which are very closely related to um, political parties but particularly the, the right wing with, with the conservative party and, and then all kinds of lobbying activities <coughs> Um, Tony Wright, who was uh, uh, stood down as, as chair of the Public Administration Committee of the House of Commons, did a series of, of, of uh, special reports, his committee, on lobbying. I mean, lobbying is a, is a big issue and showed very clearly how money counts, that you need resources to present, um, increasingly to present a professional sort of argument and so on. Um, but of course there's access and who gets access is of course um, an, another thing and then financing media outlets financing newspapers to influence public opinion in, in particular directions these are all methods of, of, of which we are all familiar with I'm sure and then there's personal contacts and <coughs> what surprised me was quite how extensive the revolving doors had become that was even two years ago but so uh, revolving between the pub private sector business sector financial sector and I mean if you look at almost any look at any area of government work the, 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 the extent to which there, there are um, business people in there either as uh, as, as uh, employed directly as uh, civil servants 
or seconded to be civil servants or uh, advisory or whatever so there's revolving out I, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself here there's revolving out and there's revolving in and then there's revolving so quickly around that you can't actually it's like a carousel you, you know you're back in from public to private straight away revolving out <coughs> um, this happened particularly I mean this this developed particularly strongly under the Blair government I regret to say the revolving out of former ministers going to have directorships in companies for which they've been involved as ministers so you didn't know exactly when they were dealing with these companies <coughs> as ministers whether they were already had their eye on on what they were going to do after they left ministerial office but the studies of that have shown I mean it was just enormous but not that, just that senior civil servants um, military personnel um, and going on to get direct ships and companies or setting up consultancies which then dealt with and there is a, a, a committee um, called the it's ACOBA which is the um, uh, of outside business appointments the advisory committee on outside business appointments yeah that's it ACOBA which, which meets and says to anyone retiring you, you must take two years out before you can act as as it were as a lobbyist for your company but as it says it's purely advisory so nobody has to take any notice of it and um, they don't on the whole and um, so why they bother but they do provide lists so you can go to a COBA website and get lists of who's in the last six months who's, who's retired and what they're told they can and cannot do and that's uh, so it's at least in the public domain but it isn't um, actually kept to and um, then then there's revolving in which as I've said is very extensive when I wrote that the uh, over the previous year I think it was of the top 200 posts so it's the top right at the top of civil service that have been advertised and filled over I think a, a 12 month period 50% had gone to outside from not from within the civil service most of whom came from the corporate sector and then <coughs> advisory groups consultancies responsibility groups set up by Lansley to deal with um, to deal with obesity and alcoholism if you remember studies of those showed that the uh, what were the firms the, the, the alcohol firms and the, um, and, and, and the chocolate manufacturers and the, the soft drinks manufacturers were all uh, on, on these uh, far outweighed um, <coughs> the, the kind of uh, medical or you know campaigning personnel um, the argument being that you know this is the nudge argument you know you don't you don't legislate you don't, you don't regulate you nudge <coughs> so stuff full of those and of course what came out uh, the recommendations that came out were fairly um, fairly worthless and then government private sector partnerships to promote um, arms sales uh, sales of all kinds underpin them with tax Tax, uh, tax money and so on and of course then informal contacts with Leveson is quite good on the, uh, this when the Cameron claimed no we don't have any direct contact with this and no, not the tax policy <laughs> Leveson was quite I can't find the quote now but somewhere in here I've got a quotation from oh yes Leveson says <coughs> There is of course no evidence at all of explicit covert deals between senior politicians and newspapers, uh, newspaper proprietors or editors. No one should seriously have expected that there would be. These very powerful relationships are much more subtle than that, he goes on. But there can be no doubt that within these relationships there have been exchanges of influence on matters of public policy which have been given rise to legitimate questions about the confidence the public can have that they have been conducted scrupulously in the public interest well it's almost an understatement but that's as far as you can go if you're Lord Leveson make clear so um, <coughs> anyway that was um, th those are some of, I mean, some of the mechanisms and of course then there's revolving very quickly between so you go out and in or sometimes then there's wearing two hats um, members of the House of Lords who are of course they're part time but they have um, also business interests um, <coughs> the latest version of the democratic audit showed that of, British, of, of House of Commons MPs 
that it, it, it's, it, it stands out um, in relation to, in comparison with all other European parliaments in terms of the numbers who hold directorships and of, of, of uh, large companies or, 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 or financial, um, financial interests and so on. So, so there's, um, that's, uh, that's the wearing two hats. Um, so I've got here just, I, I, this is from my old fashioned paper collection, just over the last couple of months. What well, comes, just a selection. <coughs> Lobbyists and interest groups still hold passes in the law. More than 100 lobbying professionals or senior managers at interest groups and businesses still hold parliamentary passes as passes given to them by members of the House of Lords, despite repeated pledges that this would be ended. Okay, here's one. Retired, a, st a sting by the um, Sunday Times, <coughs> which showed that during a three-month investigation, the court top-ranking retired military officers on camera offering to sell their contacts with ministers and former colleagues for six-figure sums. Here's Lieutenant General Richard Applegate was caught boasting of his role lobbying for a 500... He was head of army procurement in his official capacity. But this was well before the two-year lobbying, lobbying requirement had gone. He was caught boast, boasting his role lobbying for a 500 million program <coughs> on behalf of an Israeli arms company he chairs in the UK. He said he applied pressure by infecting the system at every level. Well, I mean, that's boasting. I mean, there, that may be just boasting to get custom, but nevertheless, it shows. And he, he, he said <coughs> he dismissed the system the ACOBA system for enforcing this rule that you couldn't do this within two years has entirely broken well I don't think it was ever functioning actually but I mean that's that's it okay world development movement study this is called web of power they've got some wonderful graphics showing this web of power believes that up to a third of all coalition ministers have past or present links with fossil fuel companies or with financial and services companies supporting oil and gas projects. <coughs> it all also highlights the revolving door between oil companies and the big banks. Well, there's also, I mean, BP is actually the biggest revolver um, re of, of all companies into the UK, into, into government. It's Lord Brown, <coughs> former BP, he who um, cut all the uh, made all those efficiency savings that contributed to the Gulf of Mexico disaster. Um, he is the chief advisor to, this is something I didn't mention actually, to um, these departmental boards. Every department in the civil service and in government has a board which is, which is a, 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 it's called a board, boards of the department, which have executive non-director, non-executive directors, all appointed from the business world which have the power to recommend the sacking of the Secretary of State and Lord Brown was given the role of, of headhunting suitable figures for all these different and, and if you look at the web of these are boards of each government department sitting how often they meet is not so clear but they do <coughs> exercise <coughs> and clearly they get access to inside information which is which is is straightforward so that was the um, well that was the that was the, okay and here's the um, the big four accountancy firms you'll all have read that recently using knowledge gained from staff seconded to the treasury to help wealthy clients avoid paying UK taxes okay well I could go on but I won't um, I will I will just summarize that which is how I think I end and then I will perhaps spend five minutes just saying can we do anything about it and um, <coughs> well that uh, needs more than five minutes but anyway um, no I won't, I won't say what I've uh, summarised what uh, what, what, how I end the piece because I think it's fairly obvious basically um, you know we thought government operated in the public interest it's clearly that it's clearly it operates in, largely in the private interest if you have money get there the, fact, the possibility that in a democracy um, we should all count for one and our influence should all be equal is obviously 
Um, I mean, okay, Miliband would have said this is never true, but it's less true now than it's ever been. And that the public sector has been, as it were, is a- acts, government acts as uh, basically the chief promoter for the interests of private business, whether that's in the public interest or not. We can debate how we define the public interest, but clearly um, not um, in, this, in this particular way. So, um, when I, w- uh, I, I, the one criticism that was made of my paper, um, which was come from a n- number of people, was not that it was wrong, but it was so depressing. <laughs> and that wh- why, why didn't I, couldn't I end on a more positive <laughs> note? <laughs> well, it was, I mean, it wasn't intended to be, um, uh, to, to, to be positive I mean it was basically just saying well look it's a bit of a wake up call we know this is going on but this tries to document it right across the whole range of the areas that, um, uh, that are of concern so we were, you know the things that are in the, come up, up into the public domain about lobbying about taxation about all these things try to put them together into a coherent narrative about how, where we are so <coughs> can I be less, than, less depressing and can I suggest is there anything we can do about this and this is five minutes now and I will um, first of all all these issues around agency and these powers that are exercised to influence public policy do require I think um, context specific remedies that is to say we need to get hold of party finance and and control party finance okay there have been attempts to do it as you know the parties can't agree um, but um, uh, as I would say it's one thing to suggest what should be done it's another thing to uh, to actually be able to clearly show who might do it and thirdly where they will get the political pressure from to assist them to do it but anyway as far as what needs to be done or what could be done in terms of change then I think some of these things are quite clear party finance reform with very very strong caps (coughs) thousand pounds I would put it at but um, uh, for donations um, uh, but going beyond that ok lobbying reform there's now very very clear a lot of the, the campaigning groups now come together with a series of proposals about how you reform the lobby system how you make it transparent how, it, how you make it inclusive so it includes not just lobbying companies but lobbying arms of major corporations and indeed of things like Amnesty International and so on they're all involved in lobbying but that you have this transparent and also that uh, the money flows are clear um, where the money is coming from for to pay for particular lobbying and so on so, so there's, uh, there, there is now a quite large measure of agreement among those who are concerned about lobbying though and the government has made its own proposal which are wishy-washy um, but that, that's clear also make think tanks again make transparent who funds them <coughs> and some of them have uh, um, have, have uh, charity status which is very odd because they're campaigning for market solutions I mean any any uh, the international economic affairs any, any company that campaigns for market solutions is seen as non-political right so market, if you come up, if you promote, you campaign for marketising everything, you know, um, cutting government down, making local authorities just, as it were, bookkeepers um, for services, and it's all done. You can campaign for that and have charitable status. You can't campaign, uh, as though even we weren't campaigning particularly, but you can't promote democracy. The democratic audit which is about educating people about democracy, doing these kinds of study, right? You can't get charitable status for that because it's political. Yeah, I mean, things like that, just um, why, why is, why is um, free market somehow non-political? Well, somebody said, 
<coughs> to me when after, with all the thing o over Thatcher's funeral so well, we have to conclude that neoliberalism is now the official ideology of the British state <laughs> you know so it's not political anymore um, so um, well there are, there are the things you can do about MPs I mean I've, I've always believed that, they, uh, that having second jobs should be just completely banned if you're there to do a job you shouldn't have second, second jobs period whether it's directorships whether it's whatever okay what about acting as to writing journalistic pieces I don't know um, well perhaps you should um, perhaps those should go into a fund of, of some kind um, revolving doors you need to get a grip on this ACOBA thing I, my view would be you know you, once you've been in government it, you should have at least a five year ban on uh, any on lobbying of course there's the issue of people with expertise who may government may wish to consult but I think we have to you know this has to be drawn up quite carefully and there has to be some sanction <coughs> um, because this this body is completely toothless but when we come to the structural matters well one if we're talking about the, the issue of taxation how how we deal with transfer pricing how we deal with with Starbucks paying megabucks for the, the patent on its particular coffee formula to the Swiss company which in any case and so and so on so that it has no profits in the UK even though it's telling its shareholders that the UK is the most profitable part of its business um, how how you deal with that I think there are I mean there are very clear proposals <coughs> which have come out from the OECD and 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 the European Union as, as uh, that I mean it obviously has to be done at a international level and that's where part of the problem of realization comes but where um, companies should be taxed pro uh, their profits should be taxed according to where their business is conducted <coughs> where their activity takes place rather than it all be siphoned off to some tax haven. That, I think there is m quite a lot of measure of international agreement but getting the will to do that is difficult. That, I think, uh, but it does involve you know, being serious about what the European Union does and, and being clear that, that Britain needs, um, we need the, the, these uh, intergovernmental, in, uh, supergovernmental um, forums in which these things can be thrashed out. So, Tobin tax, yes, but again, the UK is trying to get it get out of that, um, and that's again typical of the hold that these the financial sector has over us. <coughs> Ideological how on earth do we get back you know from um, this dominance of the neoliberal ideology which is so manifestly failed and uh, I mean I don't have any simple answers to that but we do have to um, start rethinking and talking about how in these in these uh, sort of dichotomies market state private public individual collective we have to find some way of making the collective the public the state somehow um, recover its uh, not only that it is so essential but also that it can be something we can be seen to value and welcome rather than be seen as just a threat how that's a huge agenda and perhaps at that point uh, I shall stop. Well, thank you, David. Um, as you say, it's a, a pretty depressing scenario. Um, I, I'm really like to take questions or comments, and you don't feel you have to frame comments in terms of questions just say what you want to say or ask what you want to ask does anybody want to kick off thank you yes. um, I'm interested 
uh, from the think tank point of view in particular. Um, I've been involved with the student think tank in Cambridge, which is a new idea, it hasn't been around long, and it's been in I've, I've led it for the last year, and it's an interesting case of a free market in policy, which I actually have come to decide in some sense it shouldn't exist, because it seems very odd that anyone basically can brand themselves as a think tank nowadays, and if they can find some sort of funding that they can weigh into a debate like that in a place where they're either unqualified or else, um, you know, maybe carrying covert uh, vested interests. So do you think there's any way to try and um, change people's ideas of whether we should have a free market for policy like that? Or would there, is, is there a way to try and either regulate think tanks or to use that? Is, is that a productive way to intervene in this whole cycle? Yeah, I mean, that, that's an interesting point because I think the, the um, clearly we need think tank. I mean, we were a think tank when we worked with, I mean, democratic audit was a think tank. Think tanks produced this, right? <coughs> and <coughs> it was no secret that we were in, funded by the Joseph Rowntree Charitable Trust, um, who gave us support throughout, almost. I mean, it, it's probably a record, the map. But. Um, so I think, I, I, I mean, I, perhaps there's something to be said for a, for a public register. I mean, you know, clearly that there are, this is part of civil society, if you like, yeah. you know, being, um, organising itself to improve public debate or to have an input in public debate and developing policy proposals, developing ideas, all of that is part of what the democracy is about. So you can't stop it. Um, but I suppose again, what you know, there might be something to be said for. Um, then what counts as a think tank? You know, I mean, if you had a register, would yours have? You know, would 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 you be on it? Um, would I mean, if you're a charity, clearly you'd have to meet certain criteria. But it, does this would this deter people from, you know, setting themselves up? Well. It's difficult to know, I mean, I, I'm, I'm now struggling as to how one would define a think tank in order or even to have a kind of register or, or them. But that, those involved, I suppose you would get to it through the lobbying regulations, that anybody who is involved in lobbying um, in government, that is to say trying to influence the government as opposed to influencing just generally public debate, should it should be clear where their funding has come from and who, on whose behalf they are speaking. And that, I think, is probably where you would start to get a handle on this, through lobbying regulations rather than through actually regulating the think tanks themselves. But I'm, I'm, I'm thinking off the top of my head now because that's a, you know, um, but I, I suppose, you know, there is always an issue about, um, uh, about you know, even if you're if you're involved coming into the public debate as a kind of neutral appearance of a neutral, when in fact you're being promoted by a particular law, particular interest, whether it's not fair, not right that the public should know that, but where the source of these ideas has come from, that's how. But how you would regulate that? I'm finding it, I would find it quite difficult, um, because clearly. Um, yeah, I think that's that's as far as I can go. <laughs> yeah. Part of the regulation might be to say they've got to be honest about what they're about because they all have such sweet, <laughs> cuddly titles, yeah. Centre for Social Research and so on, and they don't brand themselves as we're a nasty grabbing lot or, or anything like that, but I don't suppose you can do that. Um, anybody else coming in? Yes, please. Uh, a couple of things. Thank you very much for the talk. Really, really enjoyed it. Um, in terms of the Labour Party, I just wonder where you think their thinking is on this, and what are the key, uh, I suppose, the people at the top of the Labour Party. What would be the key issues there in terms of ideological dominance, or party funding, or party links, or whatever? So, you know, what are the key things that Labour needs to change if we're to get Labour to take up some of this agenda? And then, secondly. Um, just in terms of lobbying, you, you mentioned kind of democracy being about the influence of one man, or the equivalent of one man, one vote, or you know everyone's voice is equal. But is, 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 this, is there something inherently um, problematic about lobbying, even if you include uh, well-funded groups like Amnesty, say, who are you know 
put it controversially, a liberal middle class pressure group. Um, that if you've got them and then you've got the corp you know, corporations competing for influence, does that mean that ordinary people's voices, say, are still very excluded from the debate? Um, so there's something problematic about lobbying per se, or do you think it's best still that we have a kind of um, more transparent forum for competing special interests like Amnesty and like the multinationals, not to compare them completely? But, you know, well, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to think, let's just take the second of, of your comments first. Um, I, I think I'm trying to, trying to remember, um, my memory is always a bit hazy as we are as Stuart and I were discussing a, a quote from Edmund Burke when he said <coughs> when bad men organise the, the good must unite or something like that which was very un if you think that he is sort of seen as the kind of uh, spokesperson for the in independent member of parliament speaking his individual or her individual voice but I think, I think the point then would be look we have to act collectively to have any influence right in in the public domain it has to be it has to we so we can't have it's very unlikely we will have much uh, so we have to organize collectively then the question is these bodies that lobby and speak how many citizens are they actually representing because i think that then becomes important right and uh, you know national trust is the biggest if it's not the bird watchers, I can't remember, the biggest, biggest organiser. When they speak, you know, they're speaking on behalf of millions, right? And that surely is what is also what matters, not whether not how much money you have, but also how many how, who do you represent is the question. This is a question for for NGOs in, in, in general. I mean they're, they're often asked, okay, on you know, by whose authority do you speak? Well, um, it may be they're elected, but it may be, you know, but certainly being able to speak for a large number of people. So numbers count, I would have said, in those kinds of contexts, even though they're still rep representing a particular kind of interest. But I think there's also a difference. I mean, this comes out in all the literature on, NG uh, on, on lobbying, so be between representing private interests and representing a public interest and most of these if you mentioned Amnesty International is not they're not representing the interests of their members right mm. where you could say trade unions are where you could say business organizations are and so on so there are public interest groups which are taking up the core cause groups if you like which are not acting on the as it were on in their own members self interest that I think is part of what gives um, gives you know public interest bodies some of their public respect when there's the when the public has lost respect for a lot of the organizations that just come mm -hmm. for their own members self interest and and so I think those should be listened to I think that there is a normative moral dimension there if you're if if you're you know speaking on behalf of prison prisoners welfare you're not you know you're not going to be a prisoner yourself on the whole you are i mean these 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 or on behalf of okay the disabled it is on behalf of the disabled but i think there is you know I'm, if you see what i'm getting at in numbers and also interests and the character of the interests i think should count but how you make them count i think is a different question and that's quite difficult but I do think if we're talking about you know everyone everyone counts for one and this is Bentham's phrase everyone counts for one and none for more than one which is his definition of democracy <coughs> then it's numbers if we have to organize if we have to do things collectively then it should be numbers that count now I've, I've already forgotten your first point the question so, so do, do repeat it oh labor <laughs> yeah I mean I, I, th I mean, a, a, a point I didn't really get to, which is, you know, where's the political pressure? We can say what needs to be done, but where's the political pressure coming from to make, the, make give politicians an incentive to do something? And there is, I, and you could say that most of the agenda of things I read out, lobbying, um, you know, these, these kinds of 
uh, constitutional institutional change don't grab people I mean, people, it's, it's the economy it, it's, it's, it's where, where, where the job is coming from it's the welfare system these are going to be the key features of you know any of, 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 so policies have to be obviously directed towards what is likely to be I mean that sense I'm, you know it, one has to be realistic I mean I, I, would, I would like there to be a cabinet member with responsibility for cleaning up the whole of this lot from lobbying through to you know I mean it's, it includes the election to the House of Lords reform of the House of Lords I mean I do think this agenda is important even though it may not actually win, vote, win votes and it may not necessarily come high on, on uh, the, the, a, a manifesto but I do think cleaning up this whole area is um, it, uh, and the problem is always with these what look like um, con constitutional things is to make is to link them in with um, people in things that work matter for people on the ground and how you make that link between constitutional reform I mean this is always the debate we had in with, with Charter 88 and everything how you make the link between constitutional reform and what will make a difference to people's lives in terms of the kind of policy outcomes that's always the difficult thing to do so, but you can still do it I mean the, as, as the Blair government did have these successes with, the, with, with, with much of the constitutional reform agenda even though um, not all of it um, the, certainly the devolution I mean Scotland would have been independent by now if they had had devolution so that's clearly <coughs> had to be done but the others didn't necessarily so you can do good even if it's not actually high on your manifesto but I do think starting to get the narrative this, is, this, this was where I ended a narrative which starts to try and recover a sense of the collective the public what government can do is important and can make a difference and is worth valuing and all of that and so you don't go around rubbishing your front line deliverers of public services which every government in my memory now has been doing <coughs> whether they be teachers or nurses or whatever you know I mean you know so you start at a different point where actually these public services public service is still something worth doing and worth valuing and something we should all value I think there is a narrative there that actually links up quite a lot of things that Labour should be as it were putting in its policies but which at the moment I don't think has as it were won the ground from what is still regrettably despite all its failures a neoliberal um, um, monopoly May I ask a bit on that? Um, please do uh, but also if you want to come back no, that's right. yeah. well it, it, there are two kinds of narratives and the sort of narrative that, I've, that I hear <coughs> you talking about is a narrative about what we are going to do as political figures think tanks, specialists in this field people who know what's going on and therefore we can come up with a story of what we are going to do what it seems to me neoliberalism has managed to do is to, is to come up with a good narrative for the punter. You're going to be free. You're going to be a winner. You're going to be able to expand. Um, you're going to be able <coughs> to be an individual um, and have individual rights. There's no need for you to defer to anybody anymore. That's a very, very strong narrative, which is not about what we do as specialists in the field, but what people do in their lives. And I think one of the reasons why neoliberalism has gone pretty well without challenge is this cultural embedding that they've managed to get into. Where they are weak <coughs> about this is, is actually on, on the word expansion. Expansion is, beco expansion is becoming the enemy. So if we could build a, a narrative around in your life what is going to happen if expansion goes on at the same unchecked rates what is this going to do for your children for your children's children do you know what kinds of things that are going to occur in people's lives as a consequence of this and I don't hear that coming through anywhere I mean it's the sort of thing the European Union would be in a, a very strong position to develop but has been so weakened by the very forces that you're describing 
what do you say? Can you see the distinction I'm, I'm struggling with? Yeah, but I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. I, I, I do, but I, I think at the, at, the, at the point, you know, at the moment, saying, well, we can't, you know, growth is not really, shouldn't be on our agenda because, because, of, right. because yeah. of the climatic implications of that. I think that's a pretty hard sell just at the moment. I mean, it, it's, it, it, the question is, um, can you have, can you have non polluting growth economic growth can you have can you have um, stable e economies without capitalism can you have stable economies without you know huge inequalities uh, or, or what do we do about all of that? that there's a bag of questions there which is actually far beyond I think where any politician is currently um, is, is currently talking because it's all about um, the economy and how we're stagnating and how that is keeping people out of work and that's destroying the, helping destroy the public finances and all of that. And so the, 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 the climate narrative, climate change narrative is extraordinary. We're now in a very difficult point to, to do that, um, to get that. Though though I'm sure if I were a you know, Green Party uh, member or MP it would say that actually you know, alternative fuels um, alternative electricity generation and all of that can actually use, be used to stimulate the economy uh, and so on so I, that's, an, that's a whole other, other question but coming back to your point about the individual I, I, I just wonder at what point the pendulum you know, does start to swing back. We've had 30 years of individualism. Um, it doesn't actually represent how people live, actually, because a lot of the way people live depends on collective activities of a whole <coughs> variety of different kinds. So it doesn't actually... So. I mean, I just think it's time that the narrative comes back to actually not only represent how people live much more accurately, which is how your, which is your dependencies on other people around you in all kinds of contexts, and how one builds on that to, as it were, um, as a valuable part of of our lives. I, I don't think that okay, the big society was an attempt to to I mean use this kind of concept but I don't think that's the way one should go so I agree with you that, that's the, that they've had the, held the narrative and they've been very successful um, but there's so many cracks in it mm. you wonder you know, how, isn't it time we, we could exploit those cracks a bit more effectively than we are doing and who is we who should be doing that <laughs> <laughs> Could I just add, in, I think there's another narrative here, and it's the intellectual economic <coughs> narrative, isn't it? This is the way economics really works in the, you know, there's an intellectual bluff almost there, which, which justifies the policies which are being followed. They, they, they can call on the authority of all these, um, well, idiots really, who have been propagating all this Chicago school stuff and everything but people are defer to the idea that there are these experts and they're called economists and they know they know what's what and, and, uh, even though the evidence shows that they don't sorry I, I just abused the that. chair yes yeah I mean, one aspect of what you describe is the capture of political leaders elected politicians and the government leaders essentially by special interests <coughs> are these people naive or were they knaves to start with or was it the human nature that people would always be captured I mean, people could have been ideological, and they're not. Well, I mean, you know, I suppose one, one, you, you come back to analysis of the Blair government as a classic sort of uh, case of this, um, and and my my view would be that Blair and Brown actually came at this from very different angles. I think Blair, I mean, the consistent feature of Blair was nosing up to power and wealth wherever it happened, right? Whether it be George W. Bush or the City of London, or whatever. I think George Bra uh, Gordon Brown had a fairly came to the conclusion that um, that in terms of competitive advantage, 
that, that to keep the, the British economy you know, competing in the kind of world that, that they were in um, there were two things one is the, the success story was the City of London in, in, in terms of international competitiveness the other side to it was um, Britain would be, could be only successful as a low wage economy basically that's that, I mean, a hard nosed analysis of what he thought as Chancellor could do so he sweetens the city and all of that and you know deregulation on the one hand um, the other, on the other side he, he institutes the tax credits for low wages so that basically the state becomes increasingly subsidising um, subsidising employers to, um, to pay rubbish wages below, below, cost, below living wage and so those, t those two policies you could see uh, you could argue actually follow from his analysis so I think he co is coming at it from a very different point of view from Blair but they arrive at a fairly similar conclusion as it happens um, so are they naive I mean I don't think Gordon Brown was naive I think he was um, fooled as I think all of us were by the narratives that were coming out of the economics profession and uh, you know that this was <coughs> and by what the, uh, the financiers were, were, were saying um, and what the regulators were saying and what the banks of the Bank of England were saying and all of that um, so uh, but clearly that's you know those have set the parameters so, so I, don't think Gordon, I don't think Gordon Brown was naive um, he, was, uh, he was mistaken uh, which is not quite the same thing um, and um, you know the idea that this could go on indefinitely with the kind of levels of private and, and less so public debt I think anyway that's and you can't go on giving tax credits for, for a war or, or subsidising you know subsidising the housing market subsidising um, 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 uh, landlords and so on with uh, housing benefit the things that have gone up massively um, as a result of the kind of a, a view about the British economy which Gordon Brown had I don't think Blair thought of it in those terms whatsoever but um, so uh, I think with Blair it's quite different but it came to the same conclusion as it happens so that would be as it were my you know off the cuff answer to that yes um, I was wondering how free you think the EU is of like corporate interests and if you think it's quite free then how do they manage to do that? No, I don't, I don't. I mean, if you look at the lobbyists in the in the EU, I mean, you know, the lobbying by business is is huge. I mean, you you could probably tell much the same story, mm -hmm. right? The interesting question is why the outcomes tend to be rather more progressive. <laughs> okay, it's almost despite. Okay, is is do they, do they go for a Tobin tax? You know bankers tax, tax on financial transactions or rather to call it is that because the banking sector isn't so powerful in the other EU countries than it is in, in the, the US and Britain um, or you know what is it Why do, I mean this is an interesting question I don't know the answer to this why do we get more progressive outcomes you know on, on health issues <coughs> on clean water and so on I mean you do get you, you do you know we wouldn't have cleaned up our water and our beaches if it hadn't been for European directives you can say some of these are quite progressive and the is interesting question is and, and they would be fiercely fought by the, the farming industry and so on okay those lobbies exist at the European Union of course <coughs> but there's, there's something about the, 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 there isn't quite the degree of capture in, in the whole process of decision making which is so Byzantine it's quite difficult actually to understand how it happens <coughs> but certainly um, you could say European Parliament uh, you know okay they have their um, the, the, they, they have their wonderful ex expenses and so on but they do come up with some rather harder those policies than, than, than you would get from the from the British Parliament. Um, though select committees are not to be sneezed at in terms of at least making public aware from the House of Commons. You know they're not. The, if you look at the way 
because they can't get access to government government to government uh, documents um, the things they can do is give a real roasting to private sector <laughs> and bodies outside government which they do very effectively actually um, well Margaret Hodge uh, uh, you know, is, has been very effective in, in that context yes so I'm not sure I, I'm, to be honest I'm just saying I don't know the answer to that and, and probably someone will say well they're not the, the policies of the EU are not that progressive but certainly they're, they're, they're less seem to be altogether captured by private interest and I suspect that's to do with a very, the, the much more complex process of decision making that, it, that uh, I mean the, the, what Stuart wanted me to talk about was executive dominance and I think there's something about the way decision making goes in British British government, which which is 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 makes it very open to capture um, by particular interests, whether it be the Ministry of Defence, whether it be the health sector, or whatever. Right? I suspect that the, that's much less easy in the European Union because it's the, the decision making process is so complex and there's so many checks and balances in the system um, that I think it becomes less it, it probably becomes less easy I, that would be my kind of you know again an off the cuff <laughs> off the top of my head answer well going back to executive dominance uh, since you've opened the door <laughs> uh, I wonder whether you think that because the, the very different political traditions in, Euro, in the European nations more, de, more deliberative than our system, more consensual, more building in um, differences between the parties because they have proportional references. Do you think those traditions actually have a bearing on the way the, the EU yeah, and the European yeah. <coughs> Parliament works? Yeah, yeah, I'm sure that's right. I'm sure that's right. Yes. Yeah. <coughs> I forget the details, but Labour Party at one stage produced something called the Alternative Economic Strategy I think it was back in the 60s. <laughs> that's early 70s. 70s. Early 70s, yeah. Was it early 70s? Mm -hmm. Well, to what extent is any sort of thinking about strategies and, and how to deal with capitalism or modify capitalism going on in the Labour Party? I don't get the impression very much. Possibly with an invaded society, but you know, not on the front <laughs> bench. Yeah, and I, I mean, I'm sure that I'm sure that is right. Um, we don't know quite what's going to come out of John Crudders's led policy review. I mean, I don't know whether that's due to report, um, but I mean, he 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 doesn't strike one as because of quite such I mean, captive of neoliberalism. Compass Compass has been beavering away at this, has it not? Mm. Um, so there is, you know, I mean, and okay, you can read people like Will Hutton. I mean, they're not talking about um, alternatives to capitalism. They're talking about alternative forms of capitalism, and that capitalism has diverse, diverse forms, and that it doesn't have to be always the Anglo-American or or the Anglo-Saxon has become, which is Australia, New Zealand, um, Canada is a bit different, but certainly. Um, uh, that model um, doesn't have to be the only way that capitalism can be run. So there is this about alternatives. I mean, take Germany for example. Finance and and the industry is so is closely linked because of the different pattern of banking and developing of banking and the, the co and, and the ownership of of, of the in, of industries much more closely. Um, connected between banks and, um, and, and industries so that the banks are, are ready to, um, to, to operate on a long term basis because they can see so, so there's the long term short term stuff um, there's the you know complete openness um, to, of shareholding to, so that you know um, if, there's a, if there's a whiff there might be a takeover people can can uh, rush in to buy shares they may have them only for three months less than that um, it's, just, it's just a complete free for all so you can have 
have them three months and then you have no interest in who all you just do you want an immediate increase in your share the share price so you can then sell out again you have no interest in you know look what happened to Cadbury's for example in relation to craft and takeover and all those things there's no sense of you know that um, the, 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 you know, we, we've just become totally internationalised and short term and finance dominated and there are other ways of doing the capitalist thing um, well, well is that you know, I mean, Pat Devine who I run a well, yeah. this is also in that contrast that to the French approach isn't it, where you know, yeah. there's tradition of corporatism going back to yeah. three or four centuries uh, and, and the carries on they still have addiction yeah um, yeah. Uh, more of a long-term view about yeah. Business, yeah. 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 I mean, French state-owned companies can take over our yeah. bits of our. Media. Yeah. You know. I mean. It, yeah. So it's clear there are uh, there are alternate different ways of doing it, and and that I suppose is what. Um, but but. Where is it? Where 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 are the pressures for d for doing that and. You know, all this talk about rebalancing the economy, which is all this is you know, an attempt to get at this. Mm. Um, regional banks, all these things. I mean, I think they're probably just um, as it were whistling in the dark, really. Um, how you get our economy into a different form of capitalism, into a different mode, I think it's a very difficult question to answer. Even if you've decided what sort of mode you want it to be in. I don't know whether you've read stuff by Minsky. I mean, Minsky was saying that if you look at capitalism, I mean, capitalism quite enjoyed. Well, it adapts to the collapses of the economy. If you look back in the 30s, it bounces back. There is this, I suppose you might argue, contractive cycle, if you believe in that. Um, I think Minsky says some very interesting things about capitalism and how it, um, uh, it's collapsed and then it's regeneration. And this is the cycle thing that carries on. You yeah, but well also, also Schumpeter with sort Schumpeter. of destructives for this I can't remember what the phrase is he used. Creative it's destruction. Creative yeah. destruction. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but you can have de creative destruction and not, um, you know, and, and, and just not along the bottom. Schumpeter was a socialist. Without much, re much re revival. Mm -hmm. Yes, I have not followed Minsky's work, but I think it's, it's, it's not just about capitalism in general it's about particular capitalisms yeah. and and and, and the, the, the role of as you said with in terms of France and also Germany in terms of the state and in in terms of how how the state controls the market as opposed to just being op opposed as an antithesis to the market which is what we have in the in the English tradition it's like English I think probably going back to to Victorian times, to the early early 19th century. Mm. Um, I think, is it possible there's a dimension that we haven't touched upon, which is the centralisation of power in this year, which I think is far greater than in the continent, and maybe one of the reasons uh, why uh, there is such a difference. And the centralisation of power, uh, combined with the the way in which to uh, win an election, you need to have a budget of the order of 20 million, 30 million pounds, uh, which has swollen out of all proportion in the last, uh, say, 20 years or 30 years. Uh, leads to the control of the political parties, all of them now, including the Labour Party, uh, by uh, potential sources of funds. And so I think that the, it's completely understandable uh, that under Blair, Labour, having lost money, not having adequate resources coming from the unions, uh, has been obliged to follow the same route as the Conservatives and seek it from uh, corporate interests. And on this question of uh, this, this dimension of centralization, there's another way, another angle which is, which is interesting, which is this. In Switzerland, a, uh, a commune of, say, 3,000 people administers uh, the fire service, runs its own fire service, runs its own primary schools, runs the sort of lower level of uh, medical uh, provision. 
and it has a budget of, uh, of, of about 2,000, I mean I, I looked at it uh, quite a long time ago, but it has a budget of the order of 200 pounds per capita uh, to uh, dispense or, or, or use for these purposes. A, uh, a, a town in England uh, which has a town council of the, and which may have a size of about 15,000 and I've compared it to specific cases which I happened to look at about two or three years ago, uh, has a budget per capita of uh, f uh, 14 pounds. And the most important activity that, it, uh, that, that the town council can pursue, I mean, I, when I had a look at it, uh, was essentially uh, uh, the maintenance of the communal banks that, that existed within this area. It did nothing else of any significance. And so, uh, this, the, the, res, the, the sort of dissemination or the devolution of power to lower structures diminishes the risk of the centralized pushes, uh, pressures coming uh, from uh, the corporations. Which is written very much into the Swiss constitution, is it not? Yes, the that's right. That's right. Mm -hmm. How on earth one can reverse <coughs> a situation where everything is cash 22? I mean, where the parties yeah. are in the. Uh, 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 are unable to to, uh, um, to escape from this uh, domination because uh, otherwise they wouldn't exist. I, I, I confess I just don't see any uh, sensible way out of it. But well, um, <laughs> those are <t> <laughs> sorry. Does anybody want, to, anybody want to say something cheerful? <laughs> 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 huh? Well, I think I, I mean part of the problem is that the, there, there are caps on expenditure in for individual constituencies but not for what is spent by parties in, in, you know, in general and I think that's something clearly that needs to be looked at I mean the only you know you, 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 if you can't deal with it by the sources of, for, you know the, the push element from the source you, you, you deal with it by trying to control the amount that can be spent on, on um, election on, on elections by parties um, but that's yeah. Uh, okay, how, how we will get that done. But in terms of the local localism issue, I mean, Stuart and I, uh, with the Democratic Audit, have been be be beefing on about this for ages, and particularly when you compare it not just with Switzerland but with France sure. and, and, and other countries. And, uh, and there seems to be an inexorable... Uh, I mean, it's, it's driven by a number of different things. There's the centralisation. There's, there's the postcode lottery element, which is that we should have you know, the equality of citizenship wherever we live and that means equality of the same kind of expecting the same kind of treatment if you go to your do doctor or whatever and uh, or the same kind, you know, so access to the same, same, same type of schooling or whatever. So there's a kind of, the, there is a, a, as it were, a positive element to, as it were, the, some of the centralisation that we should have a common citizenship wherever we live and if we just cross a boundary we shouldn't then suddenly find, well, we, you know, the, the care for old people is totally different and totally inadequate there whereas, whereas it's one thing here. Well, I mean, okay, that may still, that may happen but that, that is where one of the pressures comes. Another, of course, is treasury control um, is, is on, on the part of the Treasury and the third is political parties once in power hate um, any, uh, of any pluralism they, they, they hate um, to be constrained by, um, by uh, authorities uh, that are in a different, under a different uh, uh, party control and so what you do is you centralise I mean, I mean the classic example of that was how the Tories created the Greater Metropolitan Counties, which was a very, which was a very useful thing, so that cities would no longer be just Labour dominated forevermore, and they could be Tory controlled. When it turned out that this didn't make that much difference, then they were, what, how long were 15 years, 16 years later, they were just abolished. When actually now we're coming back to the idea of city regions as a as, a, as an entity that actually makes a lot of sense as a governing unit. So, um, so I mean, uh, those. I think you, you, if you put those three forces together, you get a very powerful, you know, pressure pressures for centralisation, which which are actually quite difficult to reverse. I mean, just take a, an extreme example. We did a study, the Democratic Audit did a study of of uh, Burnley and Harrogate 
um, of, uh, and, uh, of, of comparing them, two very different local authorities. And one thing was done was to trace exactly the, the sources of all the public money that was spent. And in Burnley, um, the, the, the actual council, Burnley Council, um, controlled only 5% of the public money that was spent in its area, right, over which it, uh, in its electoral area. I mean, that's the, cl that's the kind of extreme sure. version of that. It's not only just where the money is, but also how. Uh, and that all the different bodies that actually uh, if affected Burnley, whether they be county councils or health districts or whatever, all, then no, none of them coincided. So you were getting a kind of patchwork. Of, and that's the kind, I mean, that obviously doesn't give the local authority any sort of control over uh, anything and this particularly came out with after the Burnley riots and all of that and, and, the, um, uh, and, and, and the also then after the BNP was getting uh, that was caused, caused great concern but what, could, what actually could the council what did it have the power to do about any of this yeah I think I, somebody here wants to come in yeah, very brief, uh, I just wanted to say how that picture is inexorable uh, march for centralization squares with, with devolution and indeed Labour's attempt to set up the regional assembly and I think it was, was the North West yeah. a few years back that North East, North East, North East, East, yeah. East yeah. Um, that's, are you talking about a, a far more localised uh, system representation w would you reject that as, um, as relevant I think I think I, I, the, the, um, I, I'm not saying that uh, the regional structures are not relevant it's clear that, that disbanding regional development agencies, which the Tories did when the, uh, the coalition government did, was a great mistake because that was one of the engines of you know, regional economic growth that was not dependent on the centre. So there are, uh, even though it wasn't an elected body, um, but it was nevertheless independent of, <coughs> independent of government. I mean, the, 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 problem, the, the, the problem with, with England, leave it just for England at the moment, which is that you did have a devolved system of government, which, was the, which were the county councils, right? And then you, with the uh, uh, county uh, town or city, right? Then you got the Industrial Revolution, which, it, which, which was very different in Britain from Germany. In Germany... It, it, it actually um, centred around the, what were already the, the head of the main cities of the, of the area. In, in Britain, it didn't do that. So you've got Leeds, Liverpool, Manchester, Newcastle. These, none of these were county towns. So, what do you, so you get a pull already between the actual centres of industry and population and the old and the old um, county towns which were the basis and we've never we've, we've never really um, you know overcome that problem and so um, that, that would be a kind of, I don't know, sort of history, brief history but I do think that the, the logical areas are these old metropolitan counties that is to say city regions travel to work they work very well and, and uh, you know they didn't have enough powers um, but the powers that they did look at I mean you know whatever you think about London you know it's that model for the for Tyneside for um, South Yorkshire or uh, West Yorkshire um, Greater Manchester Merseyside um, West Midlands and so on now what do you do with the other bits that's that was the question that always you know, you could never solve. But my view is, well, you should at least start with something that, and you do find that people do have some sense of identity, as in in, in, Man, in Manchester, let us say, where I come from, as the, 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 the have a sense of Greater Manchester. As as North West, it's a non-starter, and that's the problem. It's it's you need units of government with which people can identify in some kind of way, because otherwise. Uh, they, the, it's very difficult to get people sort of in, involved in any way. I mean that, there were two. That was there were two reasons. One is the northeast 
wasn't seen it, you know, there the bits of the North East didn't see themselves as wanting to be ruled from Newcastle, but there was also the, the powers that were offered were so derisory that, that there was, you know, a lot of people that opposed the, the, uh, in, in the referendum just opposed it because it was just not going to, you know, have, en have enough power. So even those who were in favour of regional regionalism didn't actually often you got a coalition of negative voters between those who wanted it but didn't want this thought the powers were pathetic and those who didn't want it at all so I think regional the regional thing is is more more tricky well um, thank you David thank you very much it's been a really interesting evening thank you all for coming along and for your questions and comments and um I very much hope that some of you might come along to future meetings. Actually, the next two are going to be at, um, at the ARU campus uh, on, East, on East Road. We've got, um, in a week's time roughly, we've got Henry Tam, who's an expert on kind of communal uh, and collective activity. And then another, in a fortnight's time, we have Fiona Miller, who... Um, used to advise Sherry Blair um, at number 10 Downing Street well, I don't think we should hold that against her um, and, and she certainly is a really feisty and committed campaigner for the improving the quality of school education in this country but anyway thank you all for coming it's been a really pleasant thank evening thank and you. if anyone would like this I'm sorry I, I don't know how to deal with the fact there aren't enough for everybody but there are free copies if anyone would like one just help us out thank you, thank you. Thank you. Oh, that's the yeah. Yeah.